Hello everyone and welcome to Handmade Hero, show where we code a complete game live on stream. Uh, so we're in a bit of a bind now. We basically got our octahedral sampling working. We believe the lighting is working properly with it actually. So, you know, we tested some putting basically uh, test values into the octahedral uh, voxel distribution and it looks good. I mean, it seemed to work pretty well actually. And so now we're at sort of the point where we have to kind of finish things off. And in order to get there, we, uh, well, we need two things, really. We need to debug our lighting sort of stability and sampling over time. And then the other thing, which is the really big one, because debugging is just something we can just do, right? That's just a process. Uh, the big one is the unknown, and, and I do not know exactly what we're going to do for it which is that we need some way of sampling the diffuse component of the lighting. So with the octahedral maps, what you'll remember, what you'll recall about them is, at the moment anyway, uh, we saw them as 8x8s. They have a one pixel border as well, but the actual lighting information is an 8x8. And if you recall, the idea behind these is that they can tell us the light that's coming from any particular direction, which is great. Unfortunately for us, in order to do a diffuse lighting equation, uh, it, when we look at a surface and say how much light is bouncing off the surface in a particular direction, well, normally what you have to do is sum the light that's coming in from a whole host of other directions, right? That's what makes a surface diffuse, is that it doesn't just go from one direction. So normally what we would do is if we were just computing specular all we need to do is one octahedral lookup in the octahedral map and it tells us exactly uh within the error tolerance of the low number of samples but it tells us exactly from the maps perspective what the incoming light at that point should be so that's what we want uh, for specular but once we move to diffuse and we say what's the diffuse light coming out in this direction that actually would require us to sample all of the directions in a hemisphere. And at an 8x8, eight eight, that means we're looking at something like um, uh, a 8x4, right? So it would require 8x4 samples to produce a diffuse, a completely uh, accurate from given the map uh, answer. It would be, it would literally be like in a, uh, that many samples to produce a answer for how much light there should be coming out, right? And so that's just really, really expensive. And so it's unclear that we would ever want to actually have a, you know, that we'd ever want to do the scheme that way, uh, especially when we consider that we're taking these samples very often. And so it's like, especially at render time, right? Especially, uh, you know, it's one thing to talk about how we're doing it when we actually do the light sampling for uh, propagation, because there we're probably sampling less often. And there maybe you would say, just sample the thing uh, and pay the cost. But when we're actually talking about runtime, every pixel on the screen goes through this lighting equation. And sampling all of that is not necessarily a good idea. It's hard to say, but it doesn't seem like it, right? Now, admittedly, maybe that's just wrong. You know what I'm saying? I don't actually know. And it may be something that we kind of want to test. Because if we actually go in and look, we may find that when we, when we actually see how much it costs maybe the card already has the information on it that we need. So, you know, maybe the card already has, uh, when you pull in that texture, it already grabbed the region around it. So taking all those extra samples just doesn't matter, right? They're like more or less free to add together. That could be. I don't think that story would hold up on lower end cards, but it might hold up on higher end cards. As far as the uh, rest of it's concerned, well, it does seem like we have some options we could explore. For example, if we downsample our maps so they're much smaller, like let's say that we downsample our maps down to a two by two, right? At that point, it may be the case that, well, now you can just take one sample and you basically get the incoming lighting, right? Because at that point, you've averaged things together and you've sort of produced like average lighting over the hemisphere. 
The problem with this is it's not cosine weighted, which it should be. Uh, in order to be, you know, a correct sort of Lenny equation, it should actually be cosine weighted. Now, I don't know how much that would really matter because again, we're not trying to get the lighting accurate. We're just trying to get lighting that's good, that looks good. So my, my assumption, like I'm assuming our best way out of this is to just do a down sample of the map. That's my assumption. So my guess is what we're probably gonna wanna do is we're probably gonna wanna say, all right, let's take this map, let's down sample the map uh, down to probably a two by two. Uh, so basically the maps in general will be four by four. So two by two with a one pixel border. That's just a copy of the two by two parts. Uh, and then that's what we're going to put, put in there. Now, if that actually worked well, that would be, like, let's suppose that was good. I don't know if it will be. It might be crappy. But let's suppose that was good. If that was good, that would be pretty compelling for a number of reasons. Primarily, what we would really like about that is that now we have a fairly small map to send down to the graphics card, right? Uh, because now, instead of a 10 by 10 for every probe, we have a 4 by 4 that's significantly less, right? That's more than uh, a four to one savings, right? Uh, a 10 by 10 to a four by four is going from uh, 100 to 16, right? Um, which is very, very good for, uh, in terms of the bandwidth we would have to have to send it down to the card. Similarly, it's a lot easier to sample. A 4x4 four four pulls in a lot less than a 10x10 10 10 if you're sampling a lot of stuff from it, right? Uh, that's just a l less memory footprint to go through the card. So if that worked, that would be great. And furthermore, I think we could probably say, well, what if we wanted a slightly better quality than that? We probably could do something more like if we took a 4x4 four four with a one pixel border, uh, so that we ended up with, so, you know, two by two with a one pixel border is a four by four. If we had a four by four with a one pixel border, that'd be a six by six, right? That might be better because at that point we could take multiple samples from the interior four by four, weight those together. And we know that taking like a few samples, like two or three or four, probably wouldn't kill us. So we could do something like that. And so that would be like a hybrid in between the two. So if we need more directional fidelity uh, from our lighting, which, you know, thinking about it, if, if you think about what a 2x2 two two is, it's really probably not enough. Uh, but a 4x4 four four might be, right? So thinking about in-betweens, a 4x4 four four for the interior or a 6x6 six six total seems like it might be reasonable. That's something we could do, and that would allow us to take less samples as well, but still get some more directional fidelity. For all I know, we wouldn't even really have to do much summing there. It might be like just two samples or even one sample with the bilinear might be enough to get you what you need, right? And then finally, we could just say, all right, if we wanted to do non-down sample, like we want to do down sampling, but we want to just take one sample, uh, at runtime, we know that that's actually possible too because we could just pre-compute what the diffuse should be from each point. The reason that's not so attractive is because the downsampling operation becomes very expensive because technically in order to do that, we would need to take sums of the entire eight by eight. Uh, we'd have to take sums of entire sections of that and then sum them down into the, the parts that we write out. And that is somewhat expensive, right? Now, it may be that that's still fine. It may be that that's still what we want to do. I don't actually know. It could be that we want sort of a hybrid of these two schemes. So maybe what we want to do is like blur the 8x8 down to a 4x4 first and then do this. Um, I don't really know. Uh, but my that's my feeling, right, is that's where we're at. So my guess is what we should start with is probably a full solution and see where that gets us. So, you know... Maybe we do something like take the 8x8 eight eight 
actually do the cosine weighting on it or something and produce another eight by eight that's, and this is just a disaster. Like the reason that we wouldn't do this normally is because it's just, it's too much math, right? Uh, the number of operations you need to take a eight by eight and produce a new eight by eight that is the uh, cosine weighted diffuse that maps. So an eight by eight specular to an eight by eight diffuse is more or less every single, you know, even if you write it optimally out, every single uh, one of the eight by eight in the output. So that's 64 texels that you have to write. That's well, each 64 texel, each, each one of the 64 texels itself has to sum at least 32 of the uh, inputs, right? So it'd be 32 times 64 operations for every eight by eight, right? At a minimum, it's uh, 2,048 operations for each one of these things. And so when you look at how many of those we have, if you're talking about a 32 by 32 by 32 by 32 by 64, here's your operation count at best, right? You're talking about 67 million math ops. Now the problem is, again, we have this sort of CPU, GPU side problem. Maybe the answer there would just be, well, you know, if you moved ray tracing to the GPU, well, this doesn't look so bad anymore because the GPU just has tons and tons of flops sitting around. So throwing 67 million flops at it isn't a huge deal. It will, you know, be able to do that because these are parallelizable. They're in fact perfectly parallelizable because every eight by eight is independent of every other eight by eight, right? On the GPU side, I'm, I mean, sorry, on the CPU side, I'm not as optimistic. Even if we assume, you know, this thing has like even eight threads operating this on, a, on time, each one of those threads would have to do eight million ops. Um, it's, it's not great, right? Uh, I mean, it's possible, you know, if we furthermore actually got the parallelism down, it's two million. Uh, it's just, it just looks scary, right? It just looks scary. Uh, and this is on top of whatever you were doing for lighting. So it's, it's like this is an additional stage that has to happen. So you can see why this is kind of scary to me. I don't really know. Uh, I, I, I'm not super confident that, that this is a great way to go unless it is on the GPU. And so I just don't know what to do uh, to, to make this work. And that's roughly where we're at now. Um, so yeah, so I guess my first thought is maybe we should do it because then at least we'll have a gold standard reference. So at least then we know what it will look like if we actually do sort of the optimal thing and then we can figure out how much was that costing us? Uh, you know, how, how bad is this? Right. And from there we can maybe figure out what, what our strategy is going to be going forward. Uh, it does mean that I think, if I'm not mistaken, that if we were to do it this way, and uh, you know, I don't know to what extent we're going to want some specular sampling. It may be that we want specular sampling, in which case we still have to have the padding on the original. But if we never use the specular for sampling, if it's just used as an accumulation buffer effectively, um, then we wouldn't need the padding on that. So we could drop our 10 by 10 uh, initial map to an eight by eight because you know it's more or less free to do that uh, once you stop sampling from it. So that's another thing, and I don't know. But that's where we're at. Um, so maybe I'll start with that. We'll we'll just try. We'll see. We'll see where we get. Uh, I'm not optimistic about it, but you know we'll see what happens. So I'm going to go ahead and get started looking at what that would entail. And if we go back to the way that we had, so our code, we kind of wired up everything and it, it, it's, we can flip it between the two, but we don't really have a, an answer for the raycast path yet because we don't really have a way to sample the ray, the um, diffuse lighting. So if we go in here and we change to doing our test lighting. So when we look at the test lighting pass and uh, 
you know, I don't, I don't even know why we have this anymore. We can just get rid of a lot of this stuff. I don't think any of this stuff makes any sense. We don't need any of this stuff, do we? Yeah, none of this stuff, none of this stuff is, is necessary. What, a, what is all this for? I don't even know. I don't care about any of this stuff. It's going away. It's gone. Um, so anyway, if we go in here and we just change our code uh, at the immediate moment to use the uh, diffuse sort of, uh, I'm sorry, the, the, uh, what do you want? the point radio, like the, the sphere radius light. So we're just stuffing the values in. Then what we should be able to see is when we actually run it, in here, so right here, uh, what we should be able to see when we run it is we should be able to, to see that it's, you know, specular everywhere, right? And so when we hop out to, you know, a larger room or something, uh, like we can do out here, uh, so when we hop out to a larger room and, and we take a look, you, know, you can kind of see, right, uh, that the lighting is very specular, right? It's, it's responding to me all over the place as I move the camera around. And so if we wanted to get the filtering in there, what we would prim primarily need to do here, right, is say, all right, what if we wanted this light to now be a diffuse light so that when we sample it, we're actually getting diffuse lighting, not uh, specular lighting, right? So we want to be able to produce out of our, uh, out of our specular version, we want to actually do that summation down. So what would have to happen there is, you know, you can see us doing a loop here where we output everything. You can see us doing the, um, the voxel offset writes. Uh, so that's the actual edge fill there, but right here. Um, here's us writing into the output voxel. And you can see here grabbing out of the cell and writing it in or, you know, doing the sphere version, right? Either way, it's just the test code. It's not good code. And then we output to the voxel the information that we have right here. And so the difference would be instead of actually outputting to the voxel here an, an actual thing as we get it, what we would be doing instead is building up these values and outputting them to do, you know, effectively a summation, right? So we would have a temporary buffer where we produce all of these light values uh, by, you know, either doing them here or outputting them, right? And then what we would do when we write them out um, is we would just go ahead from there and do the sort of uh, the summation on it. Now, in order to avoid us having to actually do sort of two different passes here, what I'd like to do is change the way that we've got this code set up so that rather than having the test lighting happen in here, um, I'd rather have it so that actually we go back to this method where we've got a test cast from probes versus a compute light propagation, and we already and we always actually send it down with the transfer code. Um, I think that would be preferable, right? And so if in here we said, all right, like in test cast from probes, which is in here. Uh, if we actually use this code to, to generate the stuff for us and not uh, this code here, I think that would be the first step so we could move like basically this code out to here uh, and make sure that works reasonably. So, you know, um, switching to this and this, uh, I want to go ahead and get get that transfer ready. All right. Um, so you can see here we've got some weird uh, weirdness going there. I don't know what that's from exactly. Uh, in fact, that's kind of, <laughs> that's kind of strange. What, what is that? How, how is that? How is that producing such a tight, um, Wow, that's weird. How is that producing such a tight interpolation around around the edge? That's uh, kind of peculiar, to be honest with you. I wouldn't have thought we could have got such a tight interpolation out of the edge. 
Oh, you know why that is? I think that's because this one doesn't like point the... Yeah, 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 that's why. Because it doesn't point the normals at it. But isn't that weird? Like, why are we getting that weird... And what's, what's that weird sort of like uh, cut in the middle there? I'm not sure what that's from. That's just pretty peculiar, right? Uh, I don't know if it's some kind of map sampling weirdness or something. Um, so anyway, I'd like to get that working more reliably and that way when we write the sphere. So I want to still be able to do this thing. So I want to be able to still do this uh, in that in the in the test sample code, but I want to get rid of this pass. And so we only ever do a pass where we actually produce the diffuse or whatever we want to send to the card, right? But I don't want to have this separate debug pass. So I want to always write through in test cast from probes. Again, I'm not sure what this is doing that's weird there. You can see it writing the light C versus the clamp C here and doing spam voxel, but I'm not sure why it's producing drastically different results uh, in that sort of weird line case. But what I'd like to do here is, again, so where this happens, right, you can kind of see it uh, going on here. Instead of calling spam voxel, what I'd like to do is basically have uh, another one of these. So instead of test cast from probe, uh, there'd be something else which is like, you know, uh, test light sphere or something. Something like this. And then this code here just exists to fill the voxel itself. So essentially like, you know, we would do exactly the code we're doing using the hot dim and everything. We would come through here, uh, fill in the whole like light thing, no checkerboard and no transfer. But instead now we will look up the voxel cell and instead of going this way, we'll go the other way, right? So this just allows us to write into the voxel our test pattern so that we're always picking it up from the test pattern later, if that makes sense, right? All right. Um, so I think that's all we really need there. And that produces our test sphere pattern. So <clears throat> we could get rid of it here and we could call uh, that we could leave it on transfer, right? And instead of test cast from probes, we can call test uh, light sphere with the solution and have that work. Now we will need the hot dim because we call that, right? We'll, we'll need all the stuff that's here. So we need like um, the light solution and the light position and that, that junk. So I'm gonna go ahead and grab that out here. Uh, we'll grab this, all this stuff like that. Uh, and the hot dim should be up here somewhere. I don't know where it is. There it is. Uh, and we just need the, the lighting solution here. And then I'll just grab all the things that we don't have. We need commands, inv hot dim. Yeah. Um. group and light UVW. Where is light UVW being used right now? Oh, right there, okay. All right. What else? So setup, that's just something we get off the render command group. There we go. All right. So I think that should give us what we need. I hope anyway. There we go. Um, and so now inside that code, we should get our light test and we do. Like that's exactly what we were getting before, right? So now that that's been isolated, I can clean this code up and get rid of a lot of this stuff, right? So now we can just say, all right, we don't actually need, um, in fact, the, uh, if I'm not mistaken, I cut that out as well. Yeah, so in, in voxel dim can just be placed in here as well. So this code can now, you know, get rid of all of this stuff, right? It won't need any of these things, um, and it just needs the transfer code. 
uh, which we can now improve as well. So we can nuke that. Uh, we can delete all of this. Like so. Uh, and we can just make these be direct assignments. Right? So now we can see what that copy is actually doing, right? That's all it's going to do. <clears throat> uh, and we can get rid of a bunch of these uh, values. So we don't need any of this stuff. Uh, or any of this stuff, and now we're good, All right? All right. So now you can see we cleaned up that code nicely. So we've isolated that test code, so it's you know it's easier to read and easier for us to work with as well. Um, and so now we just need to go. Okay, what would we actually put in here to create more diffuse lighting? So in this stage right here, where we're actually outputting these things. Uh, that's the part we would actually need to know. This just copies edges in the light voxel, so whatever we put in, the edge copy will work just fine. So we just need this part to do something different. Meaning when it writes this out, it needs to do some kind of summation here or something, right? All right. <clears throat> so our biggest problem here again, is just how many of these things we have to do. So if we want to actually put out 8x8 eight eight of these, uh, then, you know, this is the loop that writes out 8x8. Eight eight. So this is the, you know, this loops over 8 things, this loops over 8 things. So 64 total on the interior. And each one of these wants to figure out what the lighting contribution would have been for every other one of them. And so if you look... <clears throat> at what this would look like worst case, right? It's just more loops, right? So in other words, it would look more like this, where there's a sampling from here, like so. And so for every one of these, we need to sample every one of these, right? And again, you can see why this is so terrible. Uh, we know that this voxel cell is shared, so we're talking about the same cell regardless, right? We're always summing inside the cell. And we're summing on each of these. We know that when we write it out, it'll just look like this, so we know that that's the case. Uh, the question is, what are we actually writing out? So if we actually did want to sum this thing, um, we need to know, like, for each one of these things that we're summing, we need to know what the contribution is for every other thing. Now again, I'm just going to do the crappiest possible thing here. But for each of the 64 outputs, we would need to know the weights of the 64 inputs, a lot of which would be zero, uh, half of which would be zero, right? Or close to zero. So if we were to do uh, a table that just told us this, it would be 4,096 entries, which is not much, right? So again, the, the actual, like, information we need for the transfer, even if we don't compress it at all, is actually fine. It's just the number of operations we actually have to do that's bad. Uh, because, you know, it's 4,096 operations per map uh, that we have to account for, right? 64 outputs with 64 inputs per. Not great. Um, so anyway, if we want to do that, I say we just do it because that's, you know, the easiest thing to do. And so what we would want here is some kind of a weight map, something that, you know, lets us figure out what the weight map would be. So something like this. So we'd say, all right, uh, we've got these weight maps. So let's look one up. We know we're trying to look up the TYTX weight map. And then in here, what we want to do is say, let's sum these up. So we have our light result. I guess we could even just call this what it is. So we've got our light C. Uh, and I mean, we could just have our light D as well. 
Uh, but again, I, I don't really care about that, so I'm not going to look at it yet. And for each one of these, I'm just going to sum in the sampled one. So I'm going to say the light C equals the weight. Uh, times the cell, right? And so you can see here, you can see why this is so, you know, we talk about order notation, stuff like this, like how expensive is something, right? And order notation is usually just another way of saying how many loops do you have and what do they loop over, right? They're the same thing effectively. So you can see here we've got a Z loop, a Y loop, an X loop, a TY, TX, SY, SX. And this is why this is the kind of thing that makes me so nervous. I was like, we have so many loops. We have a voxel, which is huge, like Z times Y times X. Just a lot of order there. We've got a texture map for each one that we're filling in, which is, you know, a TY times TX. And then for each one of those, we have to loop over every other element. So it's SY times XX, right? And by the way, this is oftentimes when you hear about separable filters, right? One of the reasons why you so often hope that you can make your filter be separable, which in this case, maybe we can, right? And we're going to look at that for sure. Is because if you can break even one of these loops out, like if I could just even do this, which is what you're doing with a separable filter, do the Y pass first, then the X pass, for example. If you can figure out a way to just even do that, which maybe we can, um, that turns a multiply into an add. So instead of eight times eight operations, it would be eight plus eight operations. It goes from 64 to 16, right? Very good. So you can see why when you talk about filtering that sort of stuff, while people talk about separable filters, a separable filter is the ability to take a, two nested loops and move them into two sequential loops. And if the number is small, <clears throat> let's say you have two is the number. Um, well, you don't care because two times two is equal to two plus two right? So a separable filter doesn't buy anything. When the number is large, 8, 16, 1,000, it's a really big deal. 1,000 times 1,000 is so much bigger than 1,000 plus 1,000, right? So that's why separable filters are so important. It's tree pollen season, by the way, so... I am like completely allergy. I'm just a running faucet. <clears throat> all right. So anyway, all we would need to do to do this is build the weights table, right? Because you look here and you see, okay, we've got um, this whole thing compiling just fine. There's nothing to it. We just don't know where we're getting the weights from. This can be initialized to zero because it just is a sum. And so at that point, we just need to know what this thing looks like. Uh, so if I define this thing, well, it's pretty pretty obvious. It's just an 8 by 8 matrix, right? It's just the same as these things, um, except it's missing the border because it doesn't need the border, right? Uh, and in fact, when actually when I look at this, I suppose uh, since it doesn't need the border, I should just do uh, this, right? Um, you know what I'm saying? Because you don't, we don't actually need that border to be there. So I can do that in one of two ways. Um, I'm not sure which way is, is easier, but off you go. Uh, you know what? Probably this way is easier. For the comp I'm talking about for the compiler, not for me. Obviously, none of them matter to me. I can do them anyway. Um, but that's probably the easiest for the compiler, I would guess. Right? Um, so we loop over, we sample everything, and we sum it up, and then we write it out. And that's all we would really need. And then we just need some kind of a notion of what the heck this thing is. And so in here, we need the weights. Uh, and again, like if we did want to do the D, I could even do the D here. Like this. So I just pull that weight expression out uh, and just multiply uh, the two, the co color component and the depth component separately. Multiply by W, and then when you, you fall out, you've got both of them, and you just write them back. 
right? So again, really straightforward, not a lot to it. Uh, it's not going to be efficient or good, but it at least like let us play with this and see if it works. So at that point, we can say, all right, we just need this weight map. And, you know, we know it looks like this, right? It doesn't have the border because we don't care. Now, another way to look at this would be we could also just include the border. And the way we would include the border is just write the same weights into the border region. In other words, this loop can write our border for us too it, because it's just a general lookup. So we could have just done the whole thing. I'm not going to do that just yet. But when we actually go to do this, we may find that we want this loop to write the border. And the way we would do that, right, is just set the weights so that the border pixels equal have the same exact weight map as whatever the thing is they were going to mirror, right? I wish I had more water right now. Um, <clears throat> so again, pretty straightforward, not a lot of complexity here. So now all we need to do is just actually pre-compute some of these for us to use. Uh, so we've got our sampling hemisphere, for example, and now we would also have um, our weight maps. So I'm going to call this diffuse weight map, like so. Uh, and the same thing would, would happen here. We would have, uh, just like we've got these, like so. And we wouldn't use all of them. Uh, I also guess, I guess that's what we actually want. Now I think about it. Uh, but we might as well leave it like this. So the lookup is, is works the way it should. Uh, we don't want this to keep running because we're changing the sizes of things. So at that point, I think we're good. And now we need a loop, uh, at startup time. We only need to initialize these once they stay the same forever because the directions are not changing. So now we just need to produce this weight map. And all the weight map is, is saying what the transmission rate is between these directions. It's saying for this incoming, uh, for this outgoing direction, what would it need to sum across all of the incoming directions to produce the correct result, right? And so what I'd like to do is make a thing that's going to loop over these at init time and produce them. So at init time, when we actually start uh, the, you know, the lightning computation. Um, well, I shouldn't say when we start the when we actually do the initialization of the lighting solution. Uh, right here, we could actually do this. So we can have a thing here that's like you know build diffuse light maps, um, and this will tell us that mapping. So when we call it build diffuse light maps, I'll pass the solution. We'll have a little function here that'll do it, like so. Uh, and all we need to do now is loop over these values to in, in almost exactly the same way. So like literally this code that we're using to actually do the sum, we just want to do the exact same thing. So we'd come in here and instead now what we're going to be doing is accumulating uh, weights for each of these. So what we want to do is say, all right, let's loop through and we'll compute each of these weight maps uh, in turn, right? So we're going to go ahead and grab the weight map for this thing. And then we're going to go through each of these and write them out. So we're going to like compute a weighting for each of these somehow, right? Um, and write it back in. Okay. So exactly the same way as we were doing here, we're going to go ahead and, and try to produce that light map. Now, what we know is that we've, we want, we, we have in here like a way that we're actually producing what vectors correspond to which voxels, right? Um, so we kind of have both of those uh, equations in here uh, already. And that's what we're actually going to need. So when we look at uh, where's our actual, so here's our, right, our get octahedral offset for a particular direction. So what we effectively want is the opposite of this code. And we already have this code, right? We, in our lighting, when we're doing our uh, test, uh, our test sphere. Oops. So in here where we've got our test light sphere, our test light sphere code, we want that to, uh, to mirror it. So the exact thing that it's doing, this, this nonsense here, um, where we've got like, 
unit vector from octahedral for the sample dir, we want that to be something we can call in general, right? So we want a thing here that's like um, <clears throat> direction from txty, right? And that's just going to do this exact code, right? Exactly this code. Like that. And it's going to return that sample dir uh, to whoever inputted the txty. So in here, there's a txty that gets sent in. We do a bunch of nonsense, and out it comes at the end of the day, right? So that means in here, we would just do v3 sample dir equals blah. Like that. Um, and that should work, right? Meaning uh, we, should, we should get exactly what we want from that. Uh, because all we did was replace, we just pulled some code out and now we call it. So that test sphere should work. And so now in here, we can use these to pull out the directions for our corresponding uh, samples. So here we're going to have a lighting direction coming from the txty here. So this is the uh, out, you know, the outgoing vector. And here's our incoming vector. Right? So now we have what the incoming vector for light that we're sampling and the outgoing vector that we're trying to transmit along. And so now we just need the cosine weight between them. So if we take that inner product uh, of the outgoing and the incoming, <clears throat> when we do that, now we have that cosine fall off. But of course it can be negative. So we just want to clamp it and now we've got our transmission. Right. So there's our cosine weighted fall off. So now we're building all of those maps. So we now know what the diffuse uh, contribution will be from each of those. And if we run the code now, despite the fact that it'll probably run so slowly as to be unusable, um, we should actually have diffuse lighting from our light, right? Uh, and you can already see that, although we don't know if it's correct or not, you can already see that it does actually look like diffuse lighting, not specular lighting now, right? Kind of see, there's our, our sphere. Um, and again, it's just so dog slow, right? And this is because we're throwing all of this stuff at the CPU and it's very hard uh, for it to deal with that number of flops, especially when we're not parallelizing it. Now we could, if this is all we needed to do, we could in theory be okay because we'd just thread this and probably call it a day, right? Um, and so let me go ahead and uh, hop over here. See if I can actually rotate around, yeah. Um, and so now we can see that like, hey, we're sampling the lighting with a specular bounce, right? So we still are doing quote unquote specular lighting in a sense, like we are sampling the lighting in a, in a directional sense, but the lighting itself, it, the surfaces have a diffuse reflectance function, right? So now we get, I mean, honestly, what kind of looks like pretty reasonable lighting, right? Um, not with any shadows, right? But it looks like a pretty reasonable sphere light. Quite good, in fact, right? I don't see a lot of artifacts from the octahedral, really. So, you know, good on us. Now, I don't know. We might have some bugs in there. I'm not sure, right? I have no idea, like, you know... Uh, I really couldn't tell you like to what extent we've got uh, issues with the um, with the computation in there. So maybe it's totally wrong, uh, but at least we now see like, hey, yeah, it kind of looks that looks sort of reasonable. <clears throat> if I look out here, we do get a sphere of fall off on it, right? Um, I have no idea what that is over there. Uh, <clears throat> that's kind of weird, don't you think? So is our voxel wrapping? Because that's actually, if since our lighting voxel ends here, I believe, uh, I wonder if that's what that is. I don't know what that is. <laughs> we'll have to find out what that, like, look at that. It's just our voxel copied over for lighting. <clears throat> so I guess our voxel must be set to wrap, not clamp or something, I'm guessing. I'm not sure, because there's no lighting information out there at all, I don't think. 
Um, anyway, <clears throat> so, uh, yeah, like I said, our main problem with this is just speed. And, you know, it may be possible for us to speed this up. Uh, I'd have to think about, like, how we would do that. Obviously, we can make it four wide and uh, speed it up 4x. And then we could thread it and, you know, I don't know, maybe that's what we want to do. I'm not entirely certain um, what we want to do there exactly. Uh, but, you know, the other thing I can do, too, is I can turn on the drawing so we can look at the uh, results of this blurring, which might help us a little bit. Probably not a lot because there's not a lot of, it's not going to be immediately intuitive what should or shouldn't be happening. Uh, so, you know, if I turn on drawing the actual buffers, I don't know that we're going to learn anything from seeing them, right? Um, you know, there's the, the, uh, the blurred buffer. So what I will say is they look too, they look overly bright, right? Um, and, uh, I guess that doesn't seem wrong though, because they should be, I mean, it's, adding all of that light together and it's supposed to be and this buffer is just drawing zero to one whereas our lighting right now is not on zero to one in any particular way so i think it's all probably fine um would be my assumption right like i i don't think there's anything weird about that um and it looks all right you know again i don't think there's much we can glean from that because it's like well I mean, is it wrong or is it not? I don't know. You know, it looks fine. It's hard to say. Yeah. Um, so again, don't really know. Not sure uh, what to make of it exactly. Uh, yeah, really couldn't tell you. But again, uh, so if we do want to actually speed that up, we could actually just speed this up uh, to a certain extent. And it's not like super hard to think about how we would do that. Um, so remember, the only part, you know, the slow part is this right here. Uh, and there's, you know, probably a fair number of things we could do to make this faster at the very least. Uh, sorry, uh, not that. That's test light sphere. This. Um, <clears throat> At the very least, we could do it for wide, and you know that would cut down on our iteration pretty dramatic, dramatically, presumably. Um, <clears throat> I mean, literally just for wide, just the outer loop, presumably would be sufficient. Uh, like just like the TX, right? So do four four with the and and then we would cut down that number of iterations pretty dramatically. So we could try that. I'm trying to think if there's anything weird about doing that. Uh, and I don't think so. Because then you just have two of these, right? So we could just try just, just doing that. Um, doing, doing this four wide on the outer loop. Leaving this code exactly the same making the diffuse weight map just load four wide. So there's just like two, you know, this just happens twice. Right. Um, and then the voxel offset C part of things, we would only compute, oops. We would only compute one and we'd write out in chunks of four. So, I feel like that's probably a reasonable thing to do because it doesn't change the algorithm at all. Uh, like literally at all, I don't think. All of this would still happen exactly the same way. Um, and the only difference would be that these two, this would be a four, right? So it would be like that. And you would... Well, hold on a second. So to look up the light C, where we're sampling here. Um, so that's not entirely true.
No, it is. Never mind. So you would basically just loft this up to four wide, right? So you'd load one sample in for each of these, loft it up to four wide, multiply by the weights that go into each of these, and then each of these would just be four wide, right? That would be it, pretty sure. Um, and then when you write it out, you just need to write out four wide, uh, but that would more or less be it. So when you produce the C and D offsets here, like that, uh, and then you go to write these out, what you'd actually be doing is, is this. All right, give me, you know, the, the commands light voxel C. Give me the like float pointers for these things, right? And at that point, you should be okay. The only weird part about this uh, at that point, right? So now you're just doing this, is convincing it not to use um, aligned stores. So I may have to write this code myself uh, rather than do it the way that I'm doing it here. Because Th we're going to run into the problem with, with it's going to generate aligned stores probably here, and then it's going to crash. Uh, if it, I don't know how to, you know, I don't know if I can convince it not to do that. Maybe I can, we'll see. Uh, but anyway, so if we just do this, Right, so now we have a TX4, and the TX4 is just going to be 2. It's going to be 0, 1, and done, right? Um, it's going to look up uh, weights. They're going to be 4 wide. It's going to do the summation 4 wide, and then write it out 4 wide. I think that just speeds it up by 4x. I think. That's my claim. Um, the TX here is just one it just you know we don't we're not going to actually advance that value at all um, these are addresses and so now just confu the diffuse map itself uh, loading that out is just going to be, you know, loading a, a, the F324X out of it. Uh, we're just going to have to change the way we store that. But other than that, we're good, right? So, yeah. This is supposed to be a V34X. But other than that... think we're all right. So on the storage front, I'd have to think about that part because the V34X, so so I guess that part's not as easy unfortunately, right? Because the packing order is wrong, I want to say. Uh, we're loading up light color vectors, but we actually want to write out RGB, 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 right? And that's a little bit of an issue for us because we don't actually want to compute in that way. We want to compute R, 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 G, 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 B, 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 B. Um, just because that's the thing that would be in multiples of four. If we do it RGB, it's only threes, which is, you know, less good. So that does create a bit of a problem for us. I'm not sure what the right solution to that is. 
we obviously could just leave the maps that way, but it doesn't seem like a very good idea. So this is a little bit nastier. I'm trying to think if there is a way I could have done it to avoid that problem. Well, so maybe there kind of is. It's just kind of a little bit ugly. I mean, I suppose you could say, look, it's eight wide times three components. That's 24. Divide that by four and you just get six. So you could just have six weights you load. Yeah, but that doesn't really work either. Yeah, so I'm not sure, hmm. I'm not sure how we would do this exactly. I'm trying to think if there's any other way to do it that makes some sense. Yeah, that could still be done four wide. Easily. I wonder what would happen if we did the very most outer loop four wide. So you just load four rows and composite the rows and then uncomposite the rows at the end. Doesn't seem like a good idea though. So I think what we'd want to do here is fuse the depth and the color together then so we'd have four wide. I mean, that really seems like what you'd want to do. And the, because that way you get even spacing of everything. Unfortunately, like for some reason they didn't want to do that. In the actual paper, they always kept the depth and the RGB separate. And to be honest, we don't really know if we're ever going to use depth. So that's kind of another problem, right? If you fuse them together, though, you'd be really happy because then everything would be a, a four wide packet and you'd be, ha uh, you know, off to the races. Hmm. Well, I mean, I guess the one thing we could do easily that we could just fall back on for now is without doing any other work, we could just load these as a V3 4X, I'm sorry, as an F32 4X and do the ops on them that way, right? Um, and then when you write them out, you just only go by threes. We could do that and then you'd get 3X instead of 4X speed up from it. And, you know, I don't know to what extent that's, you know, enough. But I'm just not seeing, I'm not seeing the obvious way to, to make this work. Um, other than just by swizzling the data. If the data was planar, you know, what I just typed in is, is all we need. But with the data not being planar, it's packed. Um... Not sure how we get around it. Now, what we can do is, you know, we can swizzle it out. So we could load it, swizzle it, load it, and unswizzle it. Uh, but that seems really bad, too. So, I don't know. Let's think about this. <clears throat> Everyone sit in a moment of silence and consider your SIMD choices.
So it's worth noting that we would only swizzle on output because since we're summing here, you only have to swizzle when you get to here. So maybe that's fine. I mean, the swizzles aren't that expensive. So maybe that's really all you need. Um, hard to say, right? Uh, but that would look like this. So we have the dust color and the dust D and we're writing them in here, right? And when we actually do this and we go through here, what we'd be saying is, all right, we're doing the light color and we are gonna sum the light color for four vector, for four elements at a time. And then we need to write out those four when we get to here. Right, So I don't know that there is a swizzle on a vector right now that swaps it around to the other way, but that's what we actually want it to do. Um, since we can't quite do that and we need to write this out, what we kind of want to do here is say like, all right, we've got our, two X, our TX4. And when we write out four wides, here we need to take and write three of them. So it would really be this. You know what I'm saying? So what we need to do is write out these in chunks and we need the swizzled chunks to line up. We could probably make this just a product, uh, you know, a thing that works on these V34Xs where you just say, look, I need you to swizzle this thing and that's a known operation. So we just write them out that way. Um, and in fact, I suppose at that point we could actually just do it this way again, like I had it. So maybe we just do it like this. So we have a V34X. Uh, we write it out this way, but we need to do like a transpose on this thing. Uh, and then this transpose On our handmade SIMD, I guess that's in all inline, so I guess we actually will leave everything inlined. That's going to want to take a value, and it's going to want to swizzle the components. And just so I can show you what we're actually doing here, I'll draw it out. Um, what we want to be able to do here is take each of the... Um, let me get a blackboard up so what we want to do here is we want to say okay we've got something that stores data in the following pattern R, 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 G, 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 B, 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 right? And each of these is effectively like a SIMD lane, right? So each of these is basically like four floats, four floats, four floats. And, you know, they're in registers or something, right? XMM0, XMM1, XMM2, something like this, right? And so what we want to do now is we want to swap these out so that we get a different pattern. You know, what we're trying to do is like some nasty, you know, swizzle operation here where we get RGB, RGB, RGB. So if we look at what these sub index to, this is our byte order here. Right? So we have 12 of these, 12 floats going in that order. What we want to end up with in memory order, again, this is 
memory order. Reading in memory order. Because remember, if you actually look at the way we write things, oftentimes for registers, we go the other way around. So it would be inverted if we were looking at it little indian. We'd read that way, and it would be R0 over here. So we want to interleave these so that we would end up with R0, B0, G, I'm oh, sorry, R0, G0, B0, right? And then right here, uh, we would now want to put R1. So in a single SIMD lane, we're taking like 0, um, oh, sorry, 0, 1, 2, 3, 0, 1, 2, 3. I don't know why I numbered that way. So we want the first of each of these to go in here. And then we want, you know, the next one to be sort of half in there and half in, half in the first register, half in the second, right? And then we, I don't know why I keep writing B next. G1, B1. Oh, that was right. R2, G2, and that ends this one. And then we have our B3, R, R3, G3, B3. Right. So this is what we actually want. We want to be able to swizzle these together. And so what we need is some kind of operation that lets us select these things uh, from you know, composites. And luckily for us, as you can see, this is a rather, relatively simple interleave because in no, at no point do we have to pull from more than one source. If you have to pull from multiple sources, like three, four, five, it's pretty nasty. Um, of course, if you only have four lanes with floats, that's not super possible, but uh, for four wide anyway. But, you know, you could imagine if each one of these had to come from a different input, that would be bad. But fortunately for us, there's only two. And most Intel instructions that involve swizzling take two inputs and produce an output. So we're in good shape. We should be able to do something that allows us to pick R0, G0, B0, and then R1, right? Uh, relatively cleanly, I guess. Although now I think about it, we do have to do one intermediate step because if you look, we actually do have three, Never mind This G here, right? makes a problem for us. So we're going to have to do some series of steps. We probably can't do one instruction for each because if you look at how these are broken up here, we wouldn't, yeah, there would be no real way to do that. Um, at least not that I can see, right? Yeah. There's, there's no real way we can, we can make that work. At least not that I can tell. Yeah. Um, so that's how we would have to swizzle on right. Now, the only other thing that I'm wondering as I'm looking at this too, I'm just thinking, well, the way that we were doing this here, we just know that we have to write out these values. And if we look at what's actually coming in, when we load up these components, I'm just wondering, is there any reason we can't just make these weights pull the correct stuff in so that it's already in this order? Like, is there any reason R1 can't just be there? So, I mean, just looking at this, I'm thinking maybe, like, if we just have the weight map swizzled itself, does that just produce the right answer here? You know what I'm saying? If we build the weight map, so the weight map is just written so that it produces the, the values in this order. Like, why did I think we couldn't do that? Because this just starts at zero. It doesn't have to load anything. It's just going to sum up these values. Shouldn't it be able to sum up any values? So now that I think about it, I think maybe I'm just being stupid. Because I was sort of thinking, well, we loaded values in, but we didn't load any values in, right? There was no actual loading. So I'm wondering if this can just be made to do it. So if we load a V34X here, what are we actually getting out of this thing, right? Well, uh, when we load that, let me see where that actually goes.
uh, when we load this in, right, that's just a broadcast to each of these. So I would think that we could just make sure that the broadcast does what we need it to do. Let me think about this. Because this, I mean, essentially this part, I guess, would have to do what the, the loads per lane right. So, yeah. Yeah, if we just, so here, let's just think about this. So if we're going to load these, here's our light C for this cell, right? What we're loading in here. And we can load this in any pattern. Uh, we can load out of this as actual swizzled values if we want to, right? So meaning right now we're loading this in broadcasting X, Y, Z, but we could load this and not broadcast, right? So instead what we could do is we could load in the source, this right here, uh, which we don't really have a name for, I suppose, but this source here, the sample, we could load that in so we have basically like, you know, uh, R, S, G, S, B, S, uh, and I guess it's zero, 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 R, S, one, right? So we could load it so that we get the R, G, B, and R for this, for, you know, the, the cell here. We could load it so that that comes in aligned this way. And then when we sum these together, we could leave them in, see, we're still going to have to swizzle this because we need to get this over here for a summation, right? So it's really this load here that's the problem because if we do a load broadcast here so that we can sum everything up, then everything, that's what makes these lanes come out lined up RGB, right? That's, this is the part that does that. And once we do that, then our light color will always be in those same lanes. Obviously the light D is irrelevant because that's just, there's no packing order for those. Um, can't say I can think of a better way around this at the moment. Maybe someone out there has thought of a way already, but I don't see one. It's sort of the standard problem you run into when you have these four wide things, right? Like... you tend not to want to operate on them in the way that the SIMD wants. This is why GPUs have all the swizzles built in. And sadly, Intel didn't. Um, and here we are. But uh, yeah, not seeing it. So let me go back to the transpose just to see if we we're going to do that, if we want to do this transpose. So if we just did a basic select, uh, to get our uh, initial values here. So we can do each of these in two selects basically, right? Um, I assume, let me take a quick look at what we've got for options. Oops, I wanted that to be a new window. Doesn't look possible, how about this? There we go. Um, so if we take a look at what we've got, uh, and if I restrict us just to, you know, the basics here, I don't know what we allow ourselves to use. 
Um, but assuming that we're going to do shuffles, uh, you know, here's some options. So we've got uh, the main shuffle, which would be like this one, for example, shuff PS. Um, and shuff PS is the one that allows us to pick from the inputs in a not particularly great way, like to be completely honest, if you look at um, the way that Shuff PS works, you can kind of see that the the issue with it is it's lane constricted. So when you issue a Shuff PS, you end up being able to pick whatever you want from A, the first parameter in the first and second lanes and then whatever you want from the second parameter in the next two lanes. But you can't just arbitrarily go from any lane to any lane, right? You can if you pass the same parameter twice. That works. Uh, but you can't otherwise, right? And so in order to do um, one of these, what you would assume you want to do, you want to try, we know we can't do it in one shuffle, what we want to try and do is get it so that eat, you know we could do it in maybe six shuffles, right? So we want to end up with R G B R R G R G B R G uh, B G uh, B R G B as our you know four results, and we want to uh, start with this. So we want to be able to go you know do that swizzle. And so if you look at what we probably want to do, and we have some other options too. One of the things that's worth noting is that uh, there is, uh, if you don't want to do a shuffle, there is other ways you can do it. There's these things called unpacks um, and packs. Uh, don't actually remember how these things are set up. Uh, let's see. Yeah. So they also give you these, and the way that these work is they interleave these things together, which is more sort of what we're trying to do here. You can see how these work, like interleave D words, right? And the way this works is it takes the source from 0 to 31 first, and then the dest from 0 to 31, right? Um, and then the, uh, the same thing from 1 and 2 again, from 63 to 32, 63 to 32. Right. Uh, and so what that's designed to do is that's just designed to combine like the two vectors uh, into, into one that goes in alternating order. So if you look at how these bytes are arranged, if you take 32, uh, I'm sorry, these bits are arranged. If you take 32 bits out of each, this does sort of what we're looking for if you apply it repeatedly. So, for example, if we have this as one input, and this is memory order going this way. Again, it's, it's hard to write these sometimes because memory order goes this way, but processor order goes the other way. So, yeah. What can you do? Um, if we actually call an interleave on these, what we would get is R0, G0, R1, G1, R2, G2, R3, G3, right? And so if you look at what would happen, if we call the unpack low, right, which unpacks the low part of these, we would get this. And if we called unpack high, which unpacks the high part of these, we would get this, right? Because it takes one from the first one, one from the second, one from the first, one from the second. And again, it takes the low ones for unpack low. Then if we called unpack high, we'd get this. And that starts to look pretty good, right? This is not what we want, but it's close, right? Um, and so then the question is, well, what do we do to get the Bs in there? And then you would say, well, okay, we know now what are we looking for at the end? 
Well, at the end, we said we were looking for R, G, B, R, right? So we're looking for R0, G0, B0, R1, right? Well, we've got R, G, 0, and we've got R1. So the only thing that we're actually looking for in this case is, is the, you know, uh, the B0, which has to come, unfortunately, from another vector, right? So uh, it's like, well, not really quite what we were looking for for that particular unpack because it's like, how are we going to get that in there? If we unpacked with B, right? So let's suppose we start here and then we do the unpack again with B. We end up with not what we want because we'd end up with R0, B0, G0, B1, right? And that doesn't help us either. You know what I'm saying? Because that's not, again, we've got sort of a, a mismatch here. So we need to figure out some other way of getting that in there. We now have, we do have a vector, right? That has everything we need in it if it was combined with B0. So if we then did, I'm sorry, with uh, the B vector, right? So if we had some way of taking the first two, then just one, right, which is the B0, uh, and then sliding that R01 over. So if we could pick arbitrarily for them, we'd be super happy. But again, we can't. And again, this is just, this is why like SSE is terrible, right? No one should have to do any of the thinking that I'm doing. Right? We just have these three registers, and we want them to go to those three registers. It's just a giant swizzle. You want this to just be rote. But SSE is like a horrible instruction set, just absolutely terrible. And so as a result, you spend literally all your time drawing crap out like this. Eventually, if you do it enough, which I don't, you start to learn the tricks like, oh, okay, no, that's just I can do like, you know, this unpack and that unpack, and then we're all good or whatever, right? So anyway, let's keep trying a couple other things. Let's suppose instead of doing it that way, we take the Bs instead, right? So now let's unpack these. And we do an unpack on those. We'd get R0, right, B0, R1, B1, right? So that'd be an unpack low on those. We'd get this vector. And remember, what we were looking for is how do we go from this to R G R zero G zero B zero R one, right? How do we get there? And the answer is well, now at least if we did R and B together, right? So the first and the third, instead of the first and the second component. Now at least we know that an unpack operation with something, and we don't know what that thing is, would actually put R0 and B0 in the right locations, right? So if you magically had something here that was G0, R1, which who the heck knows how we would ever get that, but if magically we could, right? If somehow you could get that vector, well, at least this part's correct. And then the unpack would produce that. But of course, in our situation, we're like, we don't know how we'd ever get that, right? So how would we ever produce G0R1? Like, where would that come from? <clears throat> well, a G0 first component, anything that would unpack or shuffle would be able to do that if, G0, if G, the green vector was the first one. The problem is this R1. Like, where's the R1 going to come from? Because r one's the second component of this thing. And there's no way to get the second component of this thing in there because an unpack would stick an R0 there, right? Which doesn't help us. And a shuffle can't pull from that lane, right? Because if the G0 has to go first, well, it can't pull from there. So again, really not a lot we can do there, right? We're kind of back to square one. There's no obvious way we're going to be able to do an unpack there. Uh, so again, really not great. Um, pretty tricky to see how this would play out. And this is, again, why I say, like, SSE, terrible instruction set. 
Neon has none of these problems. Neon just has the swizzles built in, and you can do anything you want with that. Uh, if I remember correctly, even on load, it can just do the swizzle for you, and on store, it can unswizzle. Just the obvious thing you would do, Intel didn't do it. Because um, <clears throat> they were just like, oh, all programmers can just convert everything over to, to uh, Pact. And you're like, no, they can't. That's very hard to do, especially when you're working with a GPU that expects to sample things in the other way. But, yeah. Anyway. All right, so we still have a problem here. It's like, can we get this down to two? I don't, still don't know if we can. Obviously, we could get it down to three. That's not so hard uh, because at that point, you can just literally do uh, three selects, I mean, three uh, shuffs, and you're probably okay. But you can see why I'm worried about this, right? Because I can't quite figure out how to get it down just to two. So if we unpack this way, not clear exactly what we would be doing there. If we unpack the other way, wasn't clear what we'd be doing here. Um, so now we go, well, all right, what if we did a non-interleaved unpack? Because what we can also do is, let's say we do an unpack high PD, right? So PS, right, unpacks per element. So it's 0, 0, 1, 1, 2, 2, 3, 3. PD unpacks pairs of elements. So if we wanted to, we could produce a vector that's R0, R1, B0, B1, right? We can unpack this way as well, like by pairs. So the question is, could we use that to get us something that we need, right? And again, it's not clear whether it can or can't, but we can experiment and find out, right? So let's suppose that we wanted to try and get something that will get us closer to our RGBR pattern that we want here. What would we actually do to try and make that happen? Well, if we unpacked our R's and G's together, uh, it doesn't seem, I mean, well, I mean, maybe for the intermediate stage, hard to say, but um, again, the main issue that we're going to face here is where this R1 is going to come from. Because anything else we do with the R, Gs, and Bs actually makes a reasonable amount of sense. The question is, how does the 1 get into this position, right? Because no amount of unpacks is going to help you there. So in a sense, this one sort of looks like a problem that we're going to have to do deal with, you know, a shuff. And the shuff is lane-based this way, right? So the inputs have to stay on the side of the bar that they're on. So the question is, what can we do that would be efficient that would somehow put the R on this side for this guy, right? So the R goes into that location, just somewhere in the second side of things, um, with, a B, with a B0. So somehow an, R0, an R1 and a B0 would end up in the same side of something, right? Uh, to allow that, that shove to happen. Or, alternatively a G0 and an R1. Like, is there any way a G0 and an R1 can come out in that way, right? Both both of those be on the same side of something. And it doesn't matter what same side they're on, by the way. They just have to get it together somehow, right? In some way. Um, and again, I don't know. Uh, I guess let's try it. So let's suppose that we were going to do uh, some kind, yeah, like what would we do? I don't even know. It seems like just an impossibility that that's ever going to happen in two steps. At least not that I can see. So, because you have to think about it, right? Let's just say we ever wanted these two to come out in the same lane ever, right? Um, I'm not sure how you break that sequence, right? It just, you fundamentally can't. So, you know, you've got a B0 And what I want to do is I want to say, okay, is there any way to get this and this to come out so they're like here or here, right? So, you know, in a way to combine these two things. Um, 
And I don't know. I don't even know if we if we extended ourselves out. I don't know if we'd even have any better options there. I don't think we do. Right? Yeah. Because I don't think there's much. Is there a select? Uh, what's that? Uh, what's that function called that does the select? Uh, or is it only an AVX? No, there's a there's a select call in uh, here, but I just am blanking on the name. Um, it's not extract. It is called blend. That's what they called it. Don't ask me why. Um, so if we were out at SSE 4, which I don't know if we want to be, although it's probably safe to be now, we could also use a blend function for that. And what those do is those do let you use um, combinations of lanes in the same lane. So you could do a blend where if you had this, you could get a B0R1 in here by using a blend. I don't think there's any way to get B0R1 um, without that. Um, in one instruction, I don't think there's any way to pull the second one of one thing and the first of another into the first like two elements. Am I wrong about that? Is there any other way to do that? I don't think there is. Uh, and I don't think packs would help us here, right? Because those are all going to contract the values, which doesn't help. So I'm pretty sure only unpacks help us. Unpacks and shuffles, anyway. So I don't know. I guess we've got two ways of doing this. I can so I can think of how to do it that way, right? Because then it's pretty easy, I think. Uh, let's see. Let's see if we have a if we used blend. Let's see if we could do it in a low number of things. So to get R zero G zero B zero R one, um, we would have to do even that. I'm. It's still pretty hard, right? Uh, because I think you would waste, yeah, I don't know if you can even do it even with that, because I think you would waste uh, one of your things doing the in the transpose, uh, because you'd end up with an R1 in two different places, right? But we can sort of look at that a little bit more carefully. So uh, if we did look at what we would need here, let's just think about what happens. So if we wanted all of our values, the next one would be G1, B1, R2, G2, right? <laughs> so R2, G2 looks like just an unpack, right? So an unpack high would be R2, G2, R3, G3, right? And uh, the last one is B3, oops, B2, R3, G3, B3, right? That's the last one. And so getting the R, the G3, B3, that looks like an unpack on that. B2, R3, again, so these are always going to be the problem, ch children, right? It's basically this vector is lovely because it's aligned right g1 b1 r2 g2 the the each lane here is the same index so g3 b3 and r2 g2 
uh, G1, B1, R0, G0, those are all much more straightforward to produce because they're on the same lanes. It's the two threes uh, and the zero ones here that are happening that are kind of ugly, right? Because otherwise I think this wouldn't be so, so heinous. Um, so anyway, uh, we're going to end up with a B0, G0, I think. Uh, either way we do this. All right, so let's just start seeing if we can permute these down. So if we want an R0, G0, that's going to be an unpack RG, right? So you would want to do like an unpack low on RG. Um, and that would give us the R0, G0. Um, it would also give us the R2, G2. Uh, no, it wouldn't because it's unpack low. So we'd also need to do an unpack high on RG. And that would get us this and this. Then we need an unpack low and high on the G's. And B's, right? So that would give us these. And then we need the B0, R1, B2, R3. And those uh, would be blends, it looks like. Now the question is, if we've already done these, do we then have some options of how to do these with these interim values? And so the question would be, can we produce from this a B0, R1, or a B2, R3, right? Um, and so thinking about what these would give us, this would just give us R0, G0, R1, G1. This would give us R2, G2. R3, G3, and this would be G0, B0, G2, B2, G3, oops, G1, B1, G3, B3, right? So that's what we would then end up with. And now we're just asking, well, B0, R1, and B2, R3, how does one get these, right? So looking at what we've got here, uh, B0 and R1, right, um, appear only in those two locations and in the original. And unfortunately, like from the looks of it, they don't necessarily appear in any, in any of a better location for that. So B0 is on this side. R1 has, has moved, which helps us a little. It's in a second lane. So now we can have R1 in either lane. So maybe that's sufficient. Um, you know, or maybe it's not, not sure. I mean, I guess it does seem plausible um, and B two R three are also, yeah, are also in separate lanes now. Unfortunately, I still don't really see much good that comes from this. <laughs> so would there be any way to produce a B0, R1, B2, R3 vector? Would be the next question. Probably not. So B0, R1, nope, because they're all in different lanes yet again. 
right? So hasn't helped us even a little bit. Um, and so, yeah, let's just see though, if we want to make, so of the things we wanted to make here, right? We want R, R0, G0, B0, R1. Um, and then G1, B1, R2, G2. So G1, B1, G1, B1, R2, G2 is totally taken care of with one op. So once you build these, you can do one operation and get that. And then you have these two, but you don't have those two. And that's, so that's the only rub now. And again, so it looks like this would take, to write three things, it looks like this would take just a tremendous number of instructions. So again, I'm probably just not doing it very well. We can look up, by the way, this is something we can easily look up the answer to this question of like, what's the optimal four by three transpose for SSE. But again, we'd never worked one of these out on stream before, so I thought it might be a good idea to do so. And I haven't done some, one in a really long time, so I forget most of it. Um, I guess one other way to look at this might be to just write all of those possible unpacks out right? So of the things you can generate from the input, uh, oops, So of the things you can generate from these, we know that you know we've got unpacks, which do a interleave, right? So we know we've got this, and I'll just focus on the lows for now. So this, this, right, um, this, Uh, and then the reverses of those, which I don't think we ever care about reverses much because you can usually do it symmetrically either way. So probably you only care about the fact that these are the things we could produce, right? In terms of combinations of lanes. So we can produce any of those. We can then also produce selects, right? So we can swap any two lanes arbitrarily or grab any other thing. So, you know, we can do any of these like R0, R1. Um, we could swap those and get any of the other, uh, I guess we can, we can combine with a shuffle any two from one vector and any two from another, right? And it's unclear how we write that out. It's something we can actually look at, but any combination of these basically, right? So we could do something like this. Um, you know what I mean? So we can, we can transpose these on the interior and that might be useful, right? Because we were having trouble figuring out how to get things to align. And it may be that if we shuffle some of these first, we could do something interesting there. We can also grab any other values, right? So we can combine these two and, you know, we could do like R0, R2, um, you know, G1, G3 if we wanted, right? Because again, as long as we stay in these two it, it, on the halves, right? Um, we can pretty easily pull anything we want using the shuffle. So that's not hard, right? Um, so the question is source wise, what do we need at the end of the day? And it's really, like I said, it's really hard. Like I have a really hard time guessing these things. Um, it's just not easy. Uh, so if we want to pull from one of these, um, then what we know is there's really only two, I suppose, ways that this can work. One is that it's a shuffle between two vectors so that it's split this way, right? 
which means that there's one vector that has an R0, G0 in it somewhere, and an another vector that has a B0, R1 in it somewhere, right? So we can either be pulling from something that has an R0, G0, and a B0, R1, something like this, right? In two separate vectors. So either that implies that those two things are in two separate vectors, or it's an interleave and R0 and B0 are in one vector and G0, R1 are in another vector. So the two things we could say, I guess, about this constraint, and this maybe is a good way to look at it, I never thought about this before, is that either this has to be true, so vector A has those and vector B has those, or this has to be true. Right? So either this pattern exists in a vector in, a, in one pair, and this is in one pair, or this is a pair and this is a pair. Split on lanes, exactly as, as is, right? Um, so these have to be together in one vector, and these have to be together in another vector, or these appear in a vector, they don't have to be together, these appear in a vector and don't have to be together, right? So those are, these can be separated. So those are the constraints that we have, right? And we know that, that that's the two constraints we get from this vector. So writing those out, let's just write those out as we go. So the final ops, right, that write these, we know we've got R0, G0, B0, R1 g1, b1, r2, g2, and finally, b2, r3, g3, b3. And so then we have two things. We have the shuff constraint, right, for each of these. And we get to pick. We have a shuff constraint and an unpack constraint. So the shuff constraint is like these things just have to exist somewhere, right? So in the shuff constraint, we would say that there has to be a vector that has both R0 and G0 in it, but we don't care where. And then another vector that has B0 and R1 in it, and we don't care where, right? Same thing with here. It has to have G1 and B1 in it, don't care where, R2, G2 in it, don't care where, right? This is vector A, this is vector B. Same thing here, B2, R3, G3, B3. So that would be if shuff were used to write them. If unpack were used, then we know that it's split this way and they have to be paired. Right, so you can't actually split them up. So now we know there's an R0, B0 in something together uh, and a B0, R1. Oops, no, G0, R1, right? Same here, it would be a G1, R2 and a B1, G2, right? Same here, it would be a B2, G3, R3, B3. So these are our combination choices, right? In terms of what we know the next set of vectors has to be. So in each case, we have constraints on the vectors that would propagate forward. So we'd have an unpack here with an A and a B. We know that this tells us a lot. If we choose to unpack the last time round, we know a lot about our vectors because these have to actually be together, right? Um, and furthermore, they have to be on the same side. So these both have to be high or both have to be low, right? So this tells us a lot. This tells us significantly less. This just tells us that there's an R0, G0 in something somewhere. And a B0 and B1 in something somewhere, right? So here's the question for you. Which of these have the same inputs? Well, here's a pair right here, right? Here's BR.
right? B0, R1, B2, R3. Know what I'm saying to you? Here's another pair, RG, RG, and then GB, GB. So if we said, look, can we do this in six shuffles? The answer appears to be yes. Because if we produced the vector B0, if we produce a vector that has these things in it, R1, R3, B0, B2, right? Then we have the vector input we need for this, right? For these two ops, for writing these two. And we know we can produce this because this is just a shuff with RB. So shuff RB gives us this, and then using this vector as shuffs here will give us these. Right? R0, G0, R2, G2, in this case, same thing. So it would just be R0, R2, G0, G2. That's just a shuff, RG. And finally, this one, same thing. So a G1, G3, B1, B3 is just a shuff, GB. So in six shuffles, we can do it. Right? In six shuffles, that works. Now the question is, are any of these things duplicitous? I, they don't appear to be, right? Um, and so the only question would be, you know, and so if you looked at what these vectors have to contain, at that point you would just say, I don't think there's any way to do it in less than six shuffles if you're doing shuffles. Meaning if this, if this last thing is all shuffles, it looks like that's, that's all you could do. That's the best you could do. But of course, we know you don't have to do that. You could do unpacks, right? And so the question is, well, would an unpack get rid of one of these somehow or make it less, make there be less of it, right? Um, and if we look at what we've got here, You know, I can't say I see much possibility for that. So six shuffles looks like it would be required for at least the naive implementation, right? We've done nothing fancy, and it would take six shuffles. Let's try it. I don't know if we have a shuffle. I think it's just called shuffle, yeah. So I guess we don't have an MM shuffle in here anywhere. Um, but let's just try it. And so what we want to do here is make a result. And we're literally just doing exactly this. Um, and we can think of this as RGs and Bs as well, uh, but it doesn't really matter, right? And so if we look at this, uh, if we wanted these to be Rs to Xs, you know, Gs or Ys and, you know, Bs or whatever, it's not very complicated to figure out how this would work. We just need to then go, all right, we're going to do a bunch of shuffles here, right? So this is an MM shuffle PS. Um, and we know that inside here we need temporaries, right? So we know that we need to actually have like our F3, 4Xs, in this case, uh, let's see what we've got here. There we go. Um, and maybe we just make the shuffle work on that. So maybe we just say something like this. And I think what we probably want to do here uh, is make this a macro, right? And I'll show you why in a second. But so let's just see what we would actually want to pick here. So in memory order, if we want to do to produce this, we need our uh, our vectors, our RG vector, right? 
So we'd have our RG vector, which is an XY in this parlance, right? Probably should have done it with XYs to begin with, but you get the idea. So our XY vector here uh, is going to get shuffled. And what we want to do is we want to pick out 0, 0, right? So if we look at what we would get for shuffles here for our uh, vector, what we're thinking of, we want 0 and 2, right? And then when we do our shuffle for our next one, we want that to be, uh, oh, and you know what? I forgot the next components. So here we want BR, we want B0, R1. So uh, that's going to come from our BR vector. So that's this one. Uh, or I should say our RB vector, so that's our XZ vector. So we want to take 0 and 2 from this vector, and then we want to take 2, 0. You can see the transpose in, at work here, right? Um, <clears throat> from the other one. Our next one is G1, B1, so that's going to come from here. It's 0, 2 again from the GB vector. Uh, so the GB vector is a YZ vector, right? And then we need B1, uh, oh, sorry, and then we need uh, G1, B1, and then we need R2, G2, R2, G2, right? So we need, in this case, one, three. Uh, and we need that from the RG vector. Finally, for Z, we need uh, B2, R3. So that would be from the uh, YZ, the XZ vector. Uh, and that's three. No. B2. Oh, yeah, it is. 3, 1. Right? And then finally, we need G3, B3. G3, B3. So that's 1, 3. Um, on the YZ vector. So... That's the production for each of the final results. We still need these vectors. So we need our xy vector, our yz vector, and our xc vector. And those would be shuffles as well. And so the final thing we need to do here is produce these actual vectors. So we need r1, r3, b0, b2 for our xz vector. Uh, here's our xy vector. We'll do that first since I wrote that first. 0, 2. Um, and that's from our input. Right? And then from y, we need 0, 2 as well. Right? Uh, from y and z, What we need to do here is say, well, when we do our shuffle for uh, for y, uh, that's going to be 1, 3. And then for z, it's 1, 3 as well. And then finally, we just need um, our xz vector, which is 1, 3, 0, 2. Uh, and that's going to be on X and Z, right? Um, so in theory, this does our our uh, swizzle, and you know I don't know what the minimum op number of operations would be for this 
So I'm not sure how close we are to being good, right? Six might be too many. You know, five may be a more likely goal. Uh, but there you can see what we would do. Now we just need our actual shuffle. And we'd like to be able to write this as an actual function. But like I said, we're not going to be able to. We're going to have to write it as a macro. And the reason for that is because there's no actual way uh, to, because this is an actual instruction, the value that we pass to the shuff PS has to be a constant, right? So if you look in here, this is an immediate that gets compiled into the instruction. So it has to be a constant value. Uh, so there's not much we can do about that. And we pass 0, 1, 2, or 3, depending on what we are going to pick here. Um, and uh, we weld these together into a bit stream. So you can see like the first two bits control the first choice. The next two bits control the next choice and so on. So what we need to do here is take each of these that we have. So we have like, you know, uh, S0, S1, S2, S3. And then we have like the uh, A and B like so. Uh, and that becomes an, an shuffle PS of A and B. And uh, these we need the actual uh, P value for like so that's the packed version <clears throat> and that will return the result you know that we actually want so we can I don't know how we cast that exactly here we go so now we just need to weld you know S0 or S1 or S2 or S3 together we need to weld these into a single immediate value um, by shifting them each up some amount, right? So each of these values has to get shifted up by something. Uh, and I'm not actually sure which order we want them in, but it will be something like this, right? So that's roughly what we're looking for here. There we go. Um, so I think that's mostly what we want. And uh, that, if we actually go debug it, is the transpose that we're looking for. I would like to debug that before we go any further. Uh, I will have to fill in something just to compile it, but I would like to step through this in debugger. There's a really easy way we can then find out if we've got this thing working properly. And that is just to fill uh, these with values we actually know what they already are. So for example, if we want to know where everything ends up, we can just fill uh, the input with something and see that the output gets the transposed version of that something. So for example, if I do this, oops, right beforehand, Um, I can watch where everything goes, right? Similarly, if I do this, I can watch even better because now every element has a different thing in it. Right? And finally, if I just transpose this myself, I can actually see exactly what the heck happens by making sure it actually goes into its correct location. So for example, I can do this. Oops. Actually, let me just do it this way. So 
So now if I want to, I could actually interleave these, right? So I could say, all right, so we actually want to go zero, oops, uh, four, eight, one, five, nine, two, six, 10, three, seven, 11, right? So if we do that, now we've actually got something that, if the routine works properly, should put these numbers in order. Right? So it start there, shuffle, the output should just read off in order, right? So, you know, at the end of the day, we would expect to see Or actually, here I would expect to be able to see x e zero, e one, e two, like that, and this would let me see if this transpose actually works. Right. So let's go ahead and nerf this for just one second. Uh, and it's pretty easy to do. So if I go into diffuse weight map, uh, if I expect this to be a uh, F32 4X here, and then uh, this would not step on the same number of things. So what that would mean is like this value here, right, would, would do that. So then in here, when we actually write these out, uh, it's actually pretty straightforward because we can actually still produce it this way and say like, oh, okay, so if we're producing this many of these things, we could do like a, you know, something like this. Uh, and then at the end, we can just combine them together. Right. And it's not exactly right, but it's good enough at the moment. Uh, the reason I say it's not exactly right is because now uh, it's not, we'd have to actually make this a for I loop. Uh, which I don't know if we actually want to do. I mean, I guess we could. Why not? Right. And so now, uh, we can go take a look at that D swizzle and see if it actually does anything right. Uh, and we can also run this to see what the speed would be because even though it's probably wrong, um, the speed is presumably there. And you can see it did it, you know, it does get you quite a bit, actually. Uh, it's not nothing. So let's go ahead and debug that swizzle, and then we have to go debug the rest of it, but we're, we're mostly done now. So let's go ahead and go to our build. Turn this to a D so we can actually step through it. Go to the transpose. Um, set a breakpoint. There we go. Run it. And, whoa. Uh-oh. What happened here?
Oh, that's exactly what I said I was afraid of. See what I'm saying? Why do you ever produce a DQA, sir? I never want a DQA. Remember I said like aligned would be a problem for us? <clears throat> Fine. All right, I'll do it myself. So we need our store PS here to do a store unaligned, which it doesn't look like we have. So I don't know. We're going to have to add one of those, I guess. Uh, but try, I, I did not want it to ever generate an aligned store, but of course it does. And there's not much I can really do about that. So what I want to do here is just like force it to not do that, right? I want to force it to do a, a non-aligned store. So I want to say, look, just don't do that, okay? Not sure how to actually make this thing think it through, but probably that. It's just a pain in the butt, right? But again, all I'm doing, there's nothing important happening here at all. This is just busy work, stupid. I'm just trying to tell it not to store these things aligned. Um, what's it complaining about? Cannot convert argument one to float star. Why doesn't that take a void pointer? Anyone know? No one knows. Um, so yeah, we're just gonna write to that and we should be good. Now back to our show. So I really wanna stop at the transpose, right? I don't actually care about any of that. Um, oh, <laughs> and hey, if I wanted to bug the transpose, I should probably call it, huh? So yeah, um, in order to store the light C, we need to transpose it here. Let's add that in. Uh, and now I'm just gonna run real quick to see if we actually made transpose that works at all. So I'm just trying to debug that. And so what we can do first is just take a look after we do these shuffs. Um, I set up this order array here. Uh, so we can see what they came out to be, right? And you can see this is garbage, right? So we've got some issues here. That's not what we want. Oh, oops. It's because I put the wrong thing in there, though, for the test. Sorry. I guess I should uh, a result. Yeah, 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 yeah. There we go. Um, we want to look at the result, not the input, obviously. Although, good to verify the input, I suppose. All right, let's try that one more time. And just take a look at what comes out. So again, transposed, pre-transposed data goes in. So now we expect ordered data to come out. 0, 5, 1, 1, 6, 10 for the, ugh, no good, right? So two things could happen here. One is this is wrong, and the other is this is wrong, right? So we don't know which of these two is at fault here, right? It could be the thing we built to do this. First of all, this is obviously wrong when I just said something like this. So each of these is two bits, so we know that at the very least, it needs to be that. Now, we don't know what the order is. It could be that these are actually 3, 0, 1, 2. So I have to take a look at that. But actually, we can literally just fire and forget now if we want to. Um, <clears throat> we can just try the different permutations and not have to worry about reading the Intel spec to find out what it actually is. Um, but yeah, let's start with that. All right, 
Um, so that's at least a little bit more sane, which is good, you know, because that was pretty crazy before. But um, you can see still not quite right. Let's take a look at what these uh, internal values are just for here so I can see. So let's take a look at like what x, y. So let's just take a look at this one first. So if you remember, what we expect to see here is x0, x2, y0, y2. So x0 is correct. x2 um, is not. And I'm, I'll be honest, I'm not even sure how we could possibly have produced this. Uh, how would it ever have gotten an eight from that? Oh, wait. X zero, X two. So, yeah, no, that is actually correct. X zero, X zero, X two. Y zero, Y2. Yes, never mind. I'm I'm crazy. So that does appear to be producing what we want. So this should give us 1313. So Y1 That's correct. Y3, that's correct. Uh, 3 and 11 for 2 and 3. Let's see if those are right. Yeah. So that's correct. And then the last one is XZ. Oops. Uh, don't, didn't want to do that at all. Darn it. I hit some key accidentally. Get back here. Run to there again, please. Okay. Um, one more time. XZ. XZ. Actually, can I just do this? Why am I, why am I blowing that out for no reason? Just making type and work for myself. There we go. Um, so xz vector is 4, 1, 10, 7. So it should be 3, 1 from x. 3, 1, 1, 4. Um, So that doesn't, oh, no, sorry, I'm reading the wrong one. One and three from X, that's fine. I was like, what's going on? Zero and two from, AZ, from AZ, zero and two, yeah. All right, so all of those do look like exactly what we expect them to be, right? Um, and so, maybe uh, did we qu kind of mess up what we were thinking here. So now if we look at what we've got, um, this is like x0 to y0 to, that's what we have in here. So now in the x vector, we want to produce like, you know, we're, we're looking to produce this and then this, right? So we wanna produce something that has x0 in it, which makes sense here. Uh, and then we want to produce something that has x3 in it, which this did not. Right? So this seems like it's slightly wrong in this case. Did we screw something up here in the way we were looking at this? 
So let's see which one that was. That was the first one, the X one, right? Uh, and we said we were going to produce RGBR here, right? So Oh, so actually, no. I just flooded these values wrong, though. I did a 4 by 3 transpose. I did the other way around. So actually, if we look at what these are, <clears throat> these are not quite interleaved the way that I should have interleaved them, right? It should have actually been uh, 0, 3, right? Because it's, it's every 3 that gets interleaved. I did every 4. Don't ask me why. Um, so actually what we want here is if these were previously R, 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 and we want them to be R, G, B, R, G, B, right? So this should actually be like R, miss the G, miss the B, R again, right? So it's 0, 1, 2, 3, right? 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, right? Should have looked like that. So that was just me doing the wrong thing. Uh, this is what it should have looked like. I mean, it's it's a transpose, right? So it should just read down the columns. So I think it's just been a slow morning. Probably because I'm like completely allergy stricken at this point. But that's actually what we should have had. I mean, that's just common sense, right? Because this matrix is what's going to get transposed. So I did the, for some reason, when I did it, I did it by four. Because you could do the 4 by 3 or the 3 by 4. You could do either one. And they come out differently, right? So that may have just mean me putting in the wrong test pattern. Wouldn't that be nice, huh? Let's find out. <clears throat> Not sure why I can't set a breakpoint there. It let me do it now, but it didn't let me do it before. All right. Hey, look. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. Yeah. So that's good. So uh, that appears to work properly. Um, and I guess we don't know if we set it up right, meaning we don't actually know if the rest of the code is correct. But now we can get rid of this, and we know that uh, our shuffle actually works. Huzzah. I guess I should leave these in for people who want to try and make a faster shuffle. That way they can quickly see. Right. All right. <clears throat> um, let's go ahead and leave that for today, and we'll pick it up again tomorrow. We could also thread that, and then at this point, it would probably run totally fine for our purposes. Although, again, just. It's unfortunate that it's so expensive, right? Um, so you can see, like, we're probably close to good, but I think we may we may have a bug in there. I think we still have a bug. <clears throat> um, so you can see it's not quite right. It's almost right. But, uh, yeah, the, the stride is off or something like this. So it's close to correct, but not quite. Um, and I'm not sure who's at fault there, right? Could be anybody. We've done enough stuff now that it's a little bit confusing. Like our weight vectors could be wrong. <clears throat> we don't know. Uh, So where we're actually writing out these. Um, yeah, that's that's wrong. So this code is is not quite correct. So this W value that was supposed to load for one of each of these. Um, this is looping over the wrong thing. So the SXXY is still supposed to, to be there, right? 
And actually what gets written less is the TX value, right? Because that's where the actual loop happens. So it's this is what's actually supposed to happen, right? Um, and then so then when you do this part here where you get the directions lofted up, that's the actual part where you uh, where you actually need to um, write it out properly. So I think what we would want to do there, again, yeah, is we probably don't actually want to do this part this way because it's probably just easier since we don't need to SIMDIs this routine. It's probably simpler to say, look, just leave it the way it is. You know, don't do this. Um, and then actually compute this map and then convert it at the end, right, to what we actually want it uh, to be. So when we actually go through and produce these and we do the summation here, we would probably do something more like this. So we've got the S, Y, S, X there. So once we actually just produce these in standard scalar form, so we have to deal with it, then at the end, what we would probably do is say, all right, now let's actually move them out to where they belong. And when we load up one of these, what we're effectively doing right is we're just taking four of these at a time. So it should be as simple as just, um, as picking off of these, right? Uh, I guess the the bummer is that means it actually has to be out here, right? In terms of the way it actually gets written back. So yeah, a little bit nasty. Um, just looking at it right so we're going to produce each one of those and then we need to for each outgoing direction we're going to produce the weight matrix and now what we want to do is slice that up so that we're pulling out the weights for subsequent tx values as we go so really all that means is this now has to kind of be four wide i guess would be the way to look at it right um or we can just sort of point into the part of the diffuse map that we're actually talking about uh, either way. But what that means is like when you look at the actual lighting code, uh, this here is you know not gonna look like this anymore. So, oh, well, I guess I already did it. So you can see there's, there's a lot less of them there, right? So when we're actually looking into this one, <clears throat> what we would wanna do is say, all right, which weight map are we actually gonna write into on every single one? Right, so like when we come through here, we're gonna wanna write into a particular weight map for the that specific TX and that specific, you know, yeah, for that specific TX, TY, T everything. So if we're gonna do it this way, we need to do this part properly. So we would have to do like, all right, TY minus one, right? Because we're looking up into one that's just the just the square. That's not true. Uh, when we look up into this, how do we look up into this? Yeah, so here's us grabbing the weights out here. So we are looking into TY, TX4, and then we just pull out the things by S, Y, S, X, right? So yeah, so this is wrong. So since these are always going to be pulled out by S, Y, S, X, right? Um, <clears throat> when we actually do the lighting, what that means is that these remain at this dimension the entire time, right? And when we write back into the weight map, we're just going to actually write back into it like this. So the only question is, yeah, like when we write back in, we're writing back in wide and we're writing back in for multiple of the TXs at once, right? 
So that was a little bit of a brain bender, but that's how it's actually supposed to work. So if we look in here and we say, okay, let's try to make this work properly. Then when we grab the correct one out here, this, this is the thing that's actually gonna grab out um, the weight map multiple times interior to here, right? So, uh, I mean, I guess another way to say it would be that there's multiple of these that we do a for I loop over. Um, I'm trying to think of how we do that, but I guess we would just try and do the look up in here. We'll see how this works. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, so then at this point we have to say, all right, the addressing of the diffuse weight map is now complicated. What actually is gonna happen is we have to look up the weight map this way, where we take the TX value, we subtract one from it, and then we divide by four to figure out where we're actually looking up, right? So that's the actual weight map that we want. And then when we write in here, we write the residual of that. So we go in here and we say SY, SX. The element of this, <laughs> it's nuts, right? Uh, the element of this is the TX minus one mod four, right? So the remainder goes in here, and that's actually how the weights get written uh, in there. That's actually this. So that properly unpacks them for the way that they were actually addressed, right? Uh, and now I think we have close to correct, still probably wrong, and we'll have to track the values through. Uh, but that's at least more what it should have been. Uh, so a ton of work, right? And again, this is why I say like, the SSC instruction set just sucks. And the reason for that is very simple. The amount of time it takes to turn an algorithm from a scalar algorithm into an SSE algorithm, it's just way too much thought. Yes, you can rely on libraries or a vectorizing compiler to do it for you perhaps, but all of that thought that I'm doing had to be done by the library authors and they have to figure out a way to provide an interface or the compiler has to have all of that stuff that I just did and hope that it does it well, right? And it adds a ton of complexity to something that's already complex. It's just not good, right? If the instruction set had just had swizzles built in, that routine just would have been instant. You wouldn't have to do any of that stuff, right? You'd just say, here's what I'm loading, just, you know, I'm loading swizzled, do the ops and then write swizzled, and that'd be it. Um, and that would have been a good instruction set. Right. And way more stuff could take advantage of SIMD at that point because anybody could write it and you wouldn't have to know anything. All right, so I still want to do more debugging on that, but I think that's good for today. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think we're all right there. Uh, we can do diffuse lighting and specular lighting now. Uh, pretty straightforward. So I think we're pretty good to go. Um, and the question is just like, is that going to be too slow, right? I'll go to a quick Q&A. And by the way, we should search at some point. I mean, maybe we'll search later to see if there's a faster than six shuffles because there's probably a faster than six shuffles transpose. It'd be nice to know what it was just so for our own education, uh, for our own edification because people spend a lot of time working on these transposes and stuff and so there's probably like a definitive answer somewhere or it's like oh if you use an unpack you can do it in five or whatever right if you just put the unpack here you can save two sh two of the shuffles with one unpack something like that right
Um, and by the way, just so folks know, because um, I saw a question on the stream up that is related. Uh, transposes are symmetric, generally speaking. Um, so you usually don't have to think too hard about which way you're going, right? Um, but in this particular case, because it's a four by three versus a three by four and so on, you kind of have to think about it a little more carefully. But so what we were trying to do is we were trying to go from R, 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 G, 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 B, 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 B to R, G, B, 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 right? Volbus, why can't you do the unpack on the GPU side? Um, so yeah, well, it depends exactly what you mean by that. But if we had a little bit more specificity, so if we weren't using OpenGL, uh, we probably could do a texture submission where we submitted the data in a format that was swizzled and was easier for us to use, right? Um, since we are using OpenGL, the only way that we would really be able to do that without extensions and stuff uh, is if we just stored a red texture, a green texture, and a blue texture, right? And the reason we don't want to do that is because then we would have to actually take a lot more texture samplers, which just, gra like, it complicates the shader, like it, it forces the shader to do more instructions and it forces more texture bandwidth too because it's going to pull in the whole block of R's, the whole block of G's, and the whole block of B's even though we only needed an RGB, right? The Big Fox says, it looks like in this article they do it in six shuffles similarly to how you do it. Great. Seriously? So mean you mean that was the best we could do? Although wait, but that says 256 bit AVX. So wait, wait, AVX it still takes six shuffles. But is AVX doing six shuffles to do uh, twice as many though, or not really? Could it be feasible to pack into a different GPU supported format, maybe even compressed? Um, well, you, so you can't really pack into a compressed format, right? Um, Cause you have to do the compression, right? So that wouldn't be really considered packing. That's like compressing and sure it's feasible. You'd have to, uh, if you're going to use like a DXTC uh, format or something, you would have to sum up your values and figure out what your two interpolated values were going to be and stuff like that. But you could do it, right? <clears throat> All right, well, if they say that six is the best for 128 bits, well, that's what we did, so kudos to us, I guess. I don't know how fast six shuffles would be. So, they're dependent shuffles. You're issuing three of them. Shuffles like, I wanna say shuffles on port five and only on port five. Let me see if I'm wrong about that. So, <clears throat> yeah, um, yeah, so this code is going to suck is basically what it boils down to. Um, so like, 
basically the only saving grace for this code and the reason that it's fine probably in this case is that if you look at where this is being done we're basically doing a transpose and then a bunch of stores and then we never care right and so i think the saving grace for this code is that it plows a bunch of crap onto port 5 and then plows a bunch of stuff onto port 2 and 3 that comes out right uh no, four and five. I'm sorry. What, what, what is this? Hold on a second. Uh, two and three. So I was right the first time. Um, oh, no, I wasn't. Sorry, three and seven. Two, three, seven, and four. Those must be the right, the right ports, four and seven. I've, believe it or not, I've studied writing hardly at all because most of my work on low-level optimization ends up happening on Meowhash, which never writes anything. So my knowledge of the right port situation is, like, bad. Um, so anyway, either way... I think the only saving grace here is the fact that basically we just pile a bunch of crap onto port five and then we do our writes. Nobody needs those values. So since what's about to happen here is mostly multiplies and adds, which are not on port five. I mean, they can be, but they don't have to be like the ads can be on zero and one and the moles aren't on five. I don't think. Um, yeah. So basically port zero and one floods here and then five floods here. So we don't need to worry about the fact that like we're basically just putting enough stuff in for zero and one and five so that the fact that they all happen together is okay because it'll just interleave those in the window, I think. So the, the six shuffle thing is not horrible, but you can see why that would, if you actually had to use the results of the shuffle, so if we add a bunch of further operations that we're going to pile up behind the sh six shuffles, that would suck because you can only issue one sh shuffle per cycle. So it would literally be six cycles sitting around with these shuffles, right? Um, because it'd just be port five block, port five block, port five block, port five block, port five block. Like you'd just be blocking on port five all day long, right? Would you consider using the vector extension from Clang if you went Clang only? Um, so, like, I would probably try turning it on just to see if it did a good job, right? And then we could just avoid optimizing things until later. I don't think I'd probably count on it to do much work for me because I'm assuming I'm still going to probably have to do it. Um, but... Valibus. Do all the work we did for generating serious samples not use it? No, we use it. Uh, we're not using it at the very immediate moment because we're just plugging in the test pattern, right? But the sphere samples get used as soon as we switch to the actual light transport. As soon as we debug this, <clears throat> right? So we have to debug this and make sure we're still getting the same results whether or not we use four wide, and I'm pretty sure we probably screwed something up. So we have to go verify that that pipeline flows properly. Um... But as soon as we do that, we switch over to light transport. That still uses the sphere samples, right? Um, so yeah, it's all it's all good, um, and and then we're done. We're just maybe slow, uh, but when we switch over to the actual light transport, that's full lighting, real time lighting, per pixel, with indirect. Believe it or not. Um, and so we might be slow, but we did it, right? And, uh, and yeah. We'll have to see how, how we feel about it at that point.
<laughs> 15 minutes to take a shower. Yeah, sure, why not? The problem is it's on CPU side, so it's never going to get any faster, right? Um, that's the only downside. If it were GPU, we could probably say, yeah, 15 frames per second, sure. A couple years, Handmaid Heroes finished. The GPUs will all be way faster. Fine, you know, all good. Don't worry about it. Um, but CPUs, that doesn't really happen. So at the very least, we'd have to move all the lighting over to the GPU, right? Scallywag. What's next on the to-do list after lighting? Um, after lighting, we'll probably go in and try to do some world building. So like building some levels and so that we can start working on the art, like level structure communication stuff. Just make sure that's all working. We just need a little refinement. Is there a reasonable performance difference on a lined and unaligned move in SC2? No, there's no difference. They're the same. Um, so basically, the way that uh, the way that uh, aligned versus unaligned works these days is it doesn't matter. They're the same speed. The uh, only difference between the two on modern processors is if you happen to cross a uh, a boundary that is important. So, for example. An aligned right can never cross a page boundary. So if you imagine pages are 4K long, right? An aligned right can never straddle two 4K pages because since it's aligned to 16 bytes, there's no way to write to an aligned set of 16 bytes that crosses a page. It doesn't happen. It can't, it can't happen, right? An unaligned right can cross a 4K page. And if you cross a 4K page, you pay 32 cycle penalty, I think, for that operation. 32 cycles ain't that much, actually. So if you only do it every once in a while, you probably don't care. Unless you're really maxing out your throughput, right? Like on Meowhash, maybe we care. On most algorithms, probably you don't because you probably can't get the algorithm running fast enough that that 32 cycle bubble can't just hide a bunch of calculations you were doing anyway, right? So I don't wanna say there's no difference cause I just explained to you a difference, but it's almost no difference. So really when you're talking about aligned versus unaligned, you're usually talking more about some other thing. False sharing for cash purposes. So basically ruining your multi-threading because you're unaligned to cash boundaries or something, that could be a thing. Um, again, pretty unlikely because the fact that the algorithm, you probably wouldn't have written it that way, but you know, just point it out. Uh, other processors. So old x64 processors did care about aligned versus unaligned, um, or x86 processors, I should say. Uh, and some other, you know, embedded processors, you know, phones or whatever, you may have problems on those. So you may care, but it's probably not gonna be on an x64, right? How do you reason about separable filters when, say, running along the y-axis for an image kernel might incur a cache miss on a sequential access for non-block storage? Well, the answer there is just don't do that, <laughs> right? So a separable filter is still not usually infinitely wide. So a separable filter usually can do something like process in blocks. So you process, say, um, you know, you write out 64 bytes of your answer and then you can do the next row and do 64 bytes of your answer there, right? So usually a separable filter, you can do still do it in chunks. You know what I mean?
Is there a reason to use move APS instead of move UPS? No. There never should have been a move APS. That was just a design bug. There, there never should have been a move APS and there never should have been uh, non V the, so the way that it works on X64 is non V prefix instructions. And I'm only talking to people here, I guess, who know what any of this stuff is, but non V prefix instructions throw an exception. If the memory parameter is unaligned, that was also a huge mistake. They fixed it with V prefix instructions. So if you're actually writing modern code for modern processors, you just go, look, we're going to start with AVX. We'll put V prefix instructions on everything. And then now there's no such thing as an aligned anything. You never type move APS for any reason. It just doesn't exist as far as you're concerned. And you just have move VMOV UPS and V everything else. Right? Um, and so that's, you know, really the main thing. Run MR. How do we go back to 60 FPS now? Well, I mean, we got to get our lighting to the point where we're going to consider it done from a, like, what the look is standpoint. And once we're sure that it's done, uh, then we just optimize our code, which there's a lot of optimization potential that we can tap into here. And that may involve moving it to a GPU. It may involve just optimizing the CPU side because there's a lot of fat in there right now due to all the experimentation. Uh, and we don't know. So it's not clear exactly what we're going to want to do um, going forward. We're going to have to play that by ear. But as it stands currently, there's a ton of you know, work we can do to improve the performance. So, you know. 60 frames a second might not happen, right? 30 frames a second might be the best you can do non on non-GPU, like meaning not moving it to the GPU. If we move it to a GPU, then, you know, you have an RTX card, it'll eat this thing for breakfast. Uh, you know. I mean, the thing can do the ray tracing for us, right? Uh, so, so it's mostly just if we leave it on the CPU side. How far from release? Well, who knows, right? Depends how much game you put into it. I mean, people are still making updates to like Stone Soup, right? And stuff like that. I mean, there's games that have been in development for 30 years. You just keep adding to them. So, who knows? As long as it, it is. As long as we keep wanting to add stuff to it. As long as I'm not bored. <laughs> if I'm like, ah, I'm tired of adding stuff to this. Then I guess we release it. All right, I'm going to wrap it up. Thank you, everyone, for joining me for another episode of Handmade Hero. It's been a pleasure coding with you, as always. If you would like to follow along the series at home, you can always peer to the game on handmadehero.org. And it comes with the source code so you can play around with it yourself. Uh, I'll be back here tomorrow, at which point we will just kind of clean up the code and make sure that we iron the bugs out of the four-wide version. Maybe we'll throw it on a thread at that point, just so it's out of our hair. Uh, and then we can go ahead and move on to the work of actually finishing the ray casting stuff uh, and then that'll be that uh, I think we can actually do those on the same threading so basically we just the lighting code will take one set like one row of the voxel do the lighting on the row update and then also do the uh, bake down of the uh, you know the the diffuse bake 
So the threading model is actually trivial for us, which is great. So threading it would be free, effectively. And that's probably what we'll do tomorrow is move those two things together. Uh, and then I think, yeah, we're just in a situation of looking at the transport, trying to get that quality to a good place, playing around a little bit with some level building to put, so we can put some lights in places and see if we're getting reasonable results. Uh, but I think that's mostly, you know, where we're at. So I hope to be back here to, uh, tomorrow when we'll put that stuff in place. And then uh, hopefully next weekend we can start working on the transport stuff, like getting that cleaned up and nice. And uh, yeah, cross our fingers that our lighting's good at the end of it. All right. Until then, have fun program, everyone. And I will see you on the internet. Take it easy, everybody.